Romans chapter 8, again, and verse number 29. There it reads, For whom he did not foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn, the firstborn among many brothers. May we please stand for advice as we pray. Church, say amen. Amen. Church, say amen one more time. Amen. If you love the Lord, say amen again. Amen. Let us all bow and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, this once again we bow our heads unto you, Lord, and humble our hearts, Lord. We realize that you are God of the living, Lord, and not the God of the dead, Lord. You are the God from the beginning to the end, Lord. We praise thy name. We honor you this morning, Lord, and we stand in awe of your power and your might, Lord. Lord, we bow this morning to thanking you for Jesus, who died that death on Calvary's cross for the whole world of sin, yes. Lord. And he paid the ransom for us, Lord, that we might be with you in the last day, Lord. Lord, we bow this morning thanking you for the church through which we have salvation, Lord. We pray that you continue to bless this church, Lord. We pray that you use us as a vessel, Lord, to continue your work here on earth. Yes. Lord, we bow this morning asking you to forgive us of our sins, Lord, for we know that they are many, Lord. And we pray that you would just open our heart, Lord, to the word that's given to us today, Lord. And uh, uh, we will become better and better Christians unto you, Lord. Yes. Let us be able to cling closer and closer unto you, Lord, as we go through day by day life, Lord. Yes. Praising thy name, Lord. Lord, we bow praying on behalf of uh, the bone victims that were in London uh, uh, today, Lord, this morning. We pray that you comfort all the victims, Lord, that died innocently, Lord. And Amen. we pray that you would just uh, be able to let the families come together in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you, Lord, yes. and go forward. Lord, we ask that you would look down upon the Dinsmore family this morning, Lord. Amen. We pray that you would continue uh, to bless uh, uh, Brother Kenny Dinsmore, Lord. Uh, uh, and his sons as they suffered their loss, Lord. Yes. Brother Braylon, Brother Jordan, and Brother Chris, Lord. Yes. Continue to bless these this family, Lord, and give them strength, Lord, to uh, uh, do the things that you would have them to do. Let love them do in their heart, Lord. Let them cling closer and closer unto you, Lord. Amen. We pray this morning on behalf of the Godwin's family who is bereaved also, Lord. Amen. Comfort them in their hours of sorrow, Lord, and let them press on for the coming ghost of eternal life. Likewise, the Luther family who is bereaved this morning, Lord, we pray that you would touch them in the way, Lord, that they'll be able to look forward to the a uh, second coming of you, Lord, and we also pray, Lord, that uh, you will continue uh, uh, just to give forgive us of our sins in a manner, Lord, that we will we'll always do what you would have us to do, Lord. Yes. We come praying for the lost. We pray the lost will come back, which must I do, for it's ever less than too late, Lord. Yes. Lord. Salvation lies in the Church of Christ and in the ch Church of Christ only, Lord. Yes. We pray well, for the ones who stray by the wayside, Lord, we pray that they will uh, uh, think, Lord, and think back uh, to the church, Lord, and come back to the church to save their soul, for it's everlasting too late, Lord. And we pray that they will work out their salvation in fear and trembling, Lord. And we also come praying uh, on behalf of, of, of Sister Mitchell, Lord, who's traveling, we pray that you would just uh, let her get home safely, Lord. We pray on behalf of Sister Pat this morning, Lord. Continue to bless her, Lord. Sister Diane, continue to let her gain her strength in the other, Lord. Sister Brewster, continue to bless her, Lord. And Sister Townsend, let her gain her strength in her in help, Lord. On behalf of Brother Walker and Sister Walker, Sister Beeson, Lord. 
bread or, or help a lot of people uh, that stand in need of your blessings, Lord. And uh, uh, we know that you are there for us, Lord. We know that you sit high and look low, and you watch over us, Lord, on each and every end uh, for we need you this morning, Lord. And we also come praying for the leaders uh, of the land, Lord. We pray for our government, continue to bless them, to open your word, Lord, and uh, do what thus said to Lord, the Lord in regards of the laws that govern the land. We pray that the laws will uh, uh, benefit everyone, Lord, and not just some people, Lord. And we also come praying, Lord, for the leaders here at Henry Street, Lord, that you will bless us to open your book and do what's required of us, Lord, to continue your blessings upon the church, Lord. And we come praying for our minister likewise this morning, Lord, that you will bless him to have record recollections of the things he studied to bring before us, Lord, and break the bread of life, Lord. We ask that you crown us here with knowledge, Lord, and we will also bring our hearts with the things that he teaches us this morning that we can use it in our everyday life, Lord. And we also come praying, Lord, that you will bless uh, uh, baby Ella, Lord, uh, uh, that's still in the hospital, Lord. We ask that you would just uh, build her up, Lord, and to her most wanted help. We know that you are able, Lord, and we know that you are watching over her, Lord, and bless our uh, sister uh, Dion, uh, Lord, and uh, uh, in each and every way, Lord, let her not worry, Lord. Bless us the hooks, Lord. Continue to let her uh, gain her strength and health in, in each and every way, Lord. And uh, we just uh, ask that you would just bless our visitors also, Lord. We always welcome our visitors, Lord. And we pray that we do what's required of us, Lord, in each and every way to uh, bless them to come back and worship with us, Lord. And we pray uh, as we go through the day's worship, Lord, and uh, you would just continue to let us be a vessel unto you, Lord. And yeah. when the last day comes, Lord, and you open the Lamb's Book of Life, Lord, we pray that you'll be able to look at each and every one of us and say, well done, that good and faithful service. And this is our petition this morning. We pray that you go with us, be with us. Keep us all from hurt, harm, and danger. These blessings we ask in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning. Five hundred fifty four. Five fifty four.
Some will teach you to be 193. Some will teach you to be 195. <coughs> Some will teach you to be 15 and 17. 15 and 17. Some will 195. And My precious and sacrifices you have made to be here to worship God in spirit and in truth. Of course, we know that the world is focusing on the resurrection of Christ today. But of course, we focus on that every week, every day. And I'm hoping that it doesn't take a Catholic holiday to get people to rise out of their bed and come worship the one who died for them. The one who was spit upon, the one that was beaten, and the one that had nails in his hands and his feet for us, so that we may have a chance at eternal life. Yeah. One thing I can say is that I'm glad he's risen, because that fulfills the promise of 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17, where God is saying that all the dead are going to rise again, and that we're all going to be forever with the Lord. So thank God he lives. 
And as the old song says, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Amen. But I also like to add, because he lives, I live. Amen. As well, you live as well if you stay faithful to Jesus unto death. So again, thank you, Henry Street, for coming out to worship God in spirit and in truth and for the sacrifices you have made. I know that's not been easy for everybody, but he is worth the struggle of being here on this occasion, especially when we're dealing with physical uh, ailments. But I also want to thank you if you're a visitor here for the first time at Henry Street. I want to let you know, as always, you're our guest. We want you to come back and worship and fellowship with us once again. But one thing I do want to stress to you, it's hard to be your friend if we don't know your name. Amen. In other words, we ask that you fill out the visitor's card and pass anybody in the highway and we'll announce you before we leave this occasion. That's just to give you some warm Henry Street hospitality before you leave this assembly. Not to put you on the spot, not to embarrass you, anything like that, but we just want to show you some uh, true friendship, love, and hospitality before you leave this assembly. And of course, I thank God for my wonderful wife, but as always, take that moment as we always do and pause and think about Christ on the cross for you and how he suffered, died, and rose again that you and I, unworthy souls, may have a chance at eternal life. Now, I think my, my motive this morning is more on the lines of education. I think if everybody's going to celebrate worldwide Jesus, they need to know something about Jesus. Amen. More than just that he rose again, but what does he want from us? And what do we have to offer this magnificent Savior who also said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. So I'm going to tell you what we're talking about today. What we're going to be talking about is pattering my life after Jesus. Amen. Pattering my life after Jesus. That scripture is going to come from Romans chapter 8, verse 29 to get us started. So let's look at that one more time. And again, thank you, Brother Leon, for reading it and everybody's participating in this service so far. Let's look at Romans 8, verse 29 for a minute. Now, this is Paul writing to the church. And he said this, accordingly to all Christians, Christian then and Christian now. He says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, if you notice that, it said he's firstborn, it means he's risen. He's come back to life from being on the cross, put in a rich man's tomb for three days, and he's going to be the first one reborn and his rise again, which he certainly needed. But there's more to this scripture that we're going to go, go over um, as we progress in the message. Now, when you look at that word, predestinate, now, that word predestinate means that God preplanned. It means he thought out ahead of time. It means that he put down a blueprint for all mankind to follow in order to be pleasing and acceptable to him. So you can say it this way, for whom he did foreknow. In other words, he already knew who would become Christians. He already knew who would obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He knows all things. So even before you became a Christian, he knew when you was in the womb whether or not you would obey and become a Christian accordingly. But that did not take away your ability to decide. He didn't say that. He just said he knew what you were going to decide. He knew what you were going to do. So he didn't force anybody into Christ. He just knew who would obey and who would not. Now, let's keep moving on with this. He said, for whom he did foreknow, he also did what? Predestinate. We just said, what does that word mean? It means he preplanned. He made it a, a rule that everybody has to conform to what? The image of his son, right? Conform basically means to take on this shape of it. Like, for instance, if you spill water on the floor, it's going to be any shape, right? But if you put the water in a glass, it's going to become the what? The shape of the glass. Because why? It's conforming to the boundaries of that cup, right? Or that glass, whatever you're using. You put it in a bowl, it's going to take the shape of the bowl, right? 
And so what that is saying is, is that everybody that is wanting to be saved, God is saying you have to conform or become like the image of who? His son who is nobody but Jesus Christ. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, go on to immortality just like he did, right? Because not only did he rise again, Jesus never died again. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter number 2 that where is he? He's seated at the right hand of God, the Father, forever until all his enemies be made what? His foot stool. So how do we see that? This is what the Bible is talking about. So you'll see if you study from Genesis chapter 3 on down, which means the fall of Adam and Eve, God has been promising to send a Savior into the world. And he did so 2,000 years ago in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's look at John 3, verse 16 and 17, which many people have nicknamed the golden text of the Bible. We know verse 16 very well, but I also want us to hone in on verse 17. Let's take a focus on that later on in the message. But look what the Bible says. The sweetest words ever uttered to us. The Bible says what? For God so loved the world, world that he what? Gave. 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 Right? That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what, church? Everlasting life. We know that, but I want us to focus on verse 17 for a minute. Look what it says. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. saved. Now, let's put it together. The Bible says, go back to verse number 16. He what? Loved the world. So you mean to tell me that God loves some folks that have shed other folks' blood? Yes. He loves folks that will not honor their marriages? Yes. He, he loves folks that have been strung out on substance abuse, alcohol, drugs, prostitution, whatever the case may be. God, even though the world disappointed him, even though the world was destroyed back in Genesis one time, he still preserved eight in Noah's Ark and restarted the world again. And then came back after we still disappointed him again. Does it say what it is? He still came back and said what? I still love them. Remember, God's love is not always man's love. Remember? When God uses that word in John 3 verse 16, love, he's saying, I got power. I got power is the verb form of agape, meaning that he loves us unconditionally and self-sacrificially. So he loved the world so much that he what? Gave his son. See, this is what people don't understand about the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, verse 23, that the wage of sin is death. In other words, since death had to come into, uh, since sin came into the world, death had to follow it. Somebody had to pay the price for what you and I did. Otherwise, wouldn't anybody go? into heaven. Amen. Nobody would be saved. See, God can't make himself a liar. God has to fulfill his word some kind of way. And so if death had to occur, somebody had to die. Huh? Amen, somebody. Amen. Come on now, if you want to be human about it. Every last one of us at the pearly gates and Jesus hadn't died, just use your imagination for a minute. Everybody would have said, well, no, I'll take him, Lord. Let him be the one. Oh, we would all sound like a canary. No, he was the one that deserved it. Not me. But see, it was the opposite with Jesus. Jesus was basically saying, no, Lord, put it on me. He was saying that I'm going to sacrifice myself so that justice is fulfilled in my death. I hope you understand it, right? Justice still had to be fulfilled. But Jesus said, put it on me instead of and see, it's the same thing as in the law today. Uh, theoretically, you're not supposed to be prosecuted for the same thing twice. <laughs> when the price is paid, it's paid, and you're free as a bird, as they say. That's what the blood of Christ did for us. 
It paid the price of our sins so that we don't have to answer for them on our own. So look what it says. And this is the sweet part of the first coming of Jesus that came 2,000 years ago. Look what God's intent was in verse 17. It says, the Father, meaning God, for God sent not his Son into the world to what? Condemn, Condemn the, world. the world. Now, if God wanted to, he could have. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Because we all deserve it. Then we just start talking about Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, where God said, what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Christ Jesus. So if he would have sent Jesus the first time and said, forget it, don't save them, he would have been justified in wiping every last one of us out. Think about that now. But God's heart, what did it say in the beginning? God's heart didn't let him do something like that because it said what? He loved us. That means he loved us despite so much that what? He gave Jesus to us. Instead of condemning the world, meaning destroy it like he did in Genesis, he wanted to come do what? Save everybody. That we might what? Be saved. Be saved. Now think about it. Now look what he put. He put there, might be saved. That means there's a possibility some not going to be saved, right? And that's where we come in. That's where we have to take the offer of salvation, right? You think about it this way. If there's a check at the bank for a million dollars, you might be a millionaire. Man. The offer's there. Man. The money's there. Man. Your name's on it. Man. But if you don't show up, you won't receive anything. Amen, somebody? Man. This is a better promise than that, right? Eternal life is waiting there for you. Your name is about to be written in the book of life so that you can collect on the judgment day. But if you don't show up, the benefits don't go to waste. So y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Do you see what the word of God is actually saying unto our hearts? So obviously then, God is showing us that he loves us, wants to save, but there is a responsibility that we have to conform to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's another way of just saying to conform the image that is those who will duplicate his thoughts, those that will duplicate his words, those that will copy or put into practice his deeds will be those who will please the Father, resulting in their salvation. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and verse number 16. This is our eternal assurance. That if we truly duplicate the life of Jesus. Now remember what we're talking about. Patterning our life after Jesus, right? And if we do that, we can't go wrong. Listen to Hebrews 4, verse 14 and 16. I can tell you why you're never going wrong. Imitating any and all things Jesus did. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Again, y'all, he is risen. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us put hold fast our profession. Our profession is another word in our modern language saying, hold on to that confession. In other words, before you become a Christian, Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and verse number 33, if you confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, it's required, Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10 tells us that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In other words, to profess in King James language means to confess. It means to vocalize your faith. And God is saying to these Christians, hold on to that. Don't let it go, otherwise you can't be saved. Is that alright now? Alright. He says now, look at verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. In other words, Jesus became flesh, right? John 1, verse 1 to verse 3, verse number 14. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt what? Among us. And so that means that he knows your weakness. He knows our weakness because he inhabited a human body. Is that all right now? But was in all points what? 
tempted. So that means he knows our weaknesses, right? Amen. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet what? Without sin. sin. So he knows what temptation is, and he knows how to overcome it, and that's why he always pleased the Father God. Look at verse number 16 for a minute here. Let's look at that. Now he says, let us therefore come boldly where? Unto the throne of grace. He's talking about prayer now. That we may have what? Obtain mercy and find grace. That means God's favor. To, uh, to help in what? Time of need. He's, that, he's talking about how God can give you the strength to overcome your temptations. You have to come to the throne of grace during those moments. So that you don't fall for the devil's traps. Is that all right now? Amen. So with this being said now, again, God commanded us to conform to the image. That means become duplicates of the, of the, the thoughts, the words, and the deeds of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So in other words, he is the standard that we must pattern our lives after. This means we must study him. We must imitate his examples and we must obey his commandments in order to be saved. So we're going to address many aspects of his character in order to imitate him properly, resulting in our salvation at the end of the day. So I'm going to take you to five things that you need to take from this message very briefly in order to truly conform to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that all right, John? All right, don't say amen too quick. Some are going to be a challenge. Amen. amen. But I'm going to take you there because we got to. See, the first aspect of Jesus' character that we must imitate and incorporate into our everyday lives <coughs> is his complete devotion to God. Let me say it one more time because you don't get this, you won't get the rest of it. The very first thing we have to incorporate in our spiritual lives daily is Jesus' complete devotion to God. Look at this for a minute. Look at John chapter 8, verse 29, as one of the examples of Jesus' complete devotion that we have to imitate as well. Look what the Bible says. This is Jesus speaking about himself. It says, and he sent, and he that sent me is what? With me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that what? Please him. Always means without fail, right? Always means 150% devotion. Always means what? I never falter from doing the things that God wants me to do. When you have that mentality, there's nothing you won't do for God. When you have that mentality, you can be relied upon. When you have that mentality, the label of faithfulness is across your chest. And that's what God wants us to do, right? Did he not again say we're supposed to what? Conform to the image of Christ Jesus, right? He is our model, our prototype, our blueprint of how to be a true follower of God, right? Again, what did he say? For I do always those things that what? Please him. Amen, somebody. Now, we see that as a point, a case in point. Let me give you an example. When you go to Matthew 26. Verse number 39. Remember, Jesus wasn't just a talker. He walked the walk as well. Look what he did. And this is probably the hardest point of following God. Meaning he followed the Father's orders to go to his death. Look at Matthew 26, verse number 39. Remember in the Garden of, uh, of Gethsemane, and he was talk talking in his human status, right? Look what happened. It says, and he went a little farther. And what fell on his face? And pray, saying, now this is all showing you the agony he was going through, right? Mm -hmm. He's saying, what? Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Remember, cup means suffering. His cup was filled with what he was about to go through. You have to understand something. He knew everything, eyes wide open, was about to happen to him in that hour. He knew that he was about to be arrested. Huh? He knew that people were going to spit in his face. He knew that men were going to slap him and beat, them, beat him with, their, with his fists. He knew that Pilate would be a politician instead of a man of justice and have him whipped. He knew 
that he was going to have nails in his hands and his feet. And he's right now in a place of safety now. He's not arrested yet. But he knows it's coming. And he's saying this cup that's filled with all this suffering I just described to you. He's saying, if it be possible, that's the human side of us, right? If it be possible, Lord, let this not happen to me. That's what he's saying. Every man would have come to that point. Every woman. Who in their right mind want to walk into a beat? Who in their right mind want to walk into humiliation? Who in their right mind know that they're going to have to hang for hours on a cross? Suffer and die in one of the most tortured filled deaths that a man can have. So that's why he said, if it be possible, let this cup, what? Pass from me. But he said, what? Hold on. His human side was saying, let this go away. But what was his spiritual side saying? His spiritual side said, what? Nevertheless, not as what? I will. Do you know what we say nowadays? We're saying it's not about me anymore. Huh? You have a mission for me. I accept it. It's going to be filled with pain and suffering I don't even want to go through. But hold on, Lord. If that's what you want, so be it. Huh? It's like Jesus was saying right now, amen. Amen means so be it. Let it happen. I surrender. I agree, Lord. Look what he says. Now he said what? Nevertheless, not as I will, but what? As I thou will. will. Now you cannot get any greater devotion than what you just said. He said, I'm ready to die for you. And what happened? He surely did that. Oh, you might follow what I'm saying here today. We're going somewhere with this. I want you to stay there for a minute. So obviously there, he had what Paul was teaching us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39, that Paul is showing us through his own life as also an example of the attitude of complete devotion. We're supposed to have this will. Look what Romans instructs us by example to do in verse 38 and verse number 39. And I hope you're here. He says, for I am persuaded. That means I'm totally convinced in my own mind. Don't nobody else got to tell me. This is where I am. Look what he says, for I am persuaded that neither what? Death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, I mean rulers. That could be the White House, guys. Nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. What else? Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. That means even other people can't do this to me. Shall be able to what? Separate us. From the love of God, we're talking about our own love of God, right? Which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord, which he showed us initially. So again, what do we just see? That God wants us to what? Have that complete devotion that Jesus not only talked about, but also demonstrated in front of all of us. Point number two here. The second aspect of Jesus' character that we must imitate and incorporate into our everyday lives is that he put God over family. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Because we got a lot of family sitting here right now. Man. Some of y'all, come on, can I be real now? Come on, come on. Some of y'all wives said, I hope we ain't in church all day. <laughs> huh? Huh? I hope you don't preach more than 20 minutes. In fact, some of y'all say you need to stay home with me and wife stayed at home. Uh, huh? Man. But thank God you came anyway. Man. Because why? That's conforming to the image of Christ. Man. Not the image of what you want to do. Man. Not the image of what your wife wants. Man. Not the image of what your husband wants. Because I'm going to tell you something. When we come to the judgment day, there ain't no more ties of marriage, no way. We got the answer for our sales. And I don't want God to ever say to me on the judgment day, did you love Jocelyn more than, oh, amen, somebody. Amen. God don't get, I, I, I might get in trouble. I'm going to tell you this. But <laughs> when we were first married, I told her from the very beginning amen. that, number one, I'm going to be a preacher. Do you still want to marry me? Amen. Because some women turned off. 
about that. She, she hung in there on that. And I told her point blank. I told her like nicely. I wasn't evil about it. But if there's a decision that you're going to try to make me make that sways me from God, you own your own. Amen. 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 That was the ground rule Amen. from the very beginning. And she's the same way with me. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. So we're trying to prop each other up Amen. and be closer than Christ as individuals, no matter what's going on in our marriage. Because we understood that we all have to stand in front of Christ by ourselves. I can't argue her into heaven and she can't argue me into it. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. And so that's one thing that Jesus is going to show us that is him over even family in all things. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 to verse number 50. And I'm going to show you this. That's why you have to be careful who you marry now. Amen. Some folks will be a thorn in your side and kill you spiritually. Amen. Amen. Instead of being helpful to you Amen. from a spiritual standpoint. But I ain't got time to deal with that right now. Look at Matthew 12, verse 46, number 15. Now, going back to Jesus, showing how he personally put the church, per first personally put, I shouldn't call it the church then, but the disciples, let me correct myself, and God above even his own family. Look what he said. He said, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without him. He's talking about his blood family now. Desire what? To speak with him. Now, he was teaching, if you want to call it today, a Bible class. He was in the midst of talking to a crowd. And mama, oh, y'all don't get it. Mama sometimes get too big for her britches. Oh, hey, man, somebody. I'm glad he wasn't a mama's boy. He went, oh, mama, hey, and left everybody. No, no. He loved his dad. Well, I'm talking about his father, God. Than what mother could say, right? Not disrespecting mom. Don't, don't take me the wrong way. But what he's showing you is an example. Look what he said. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brother stand without me and outside the crowd, desiring to what? Speak with thee. Well, let's go to the next one. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brother? Keep going. Now, if you stop there, you think he's being disrespectful. That's not what he's doing. And look what he did. He said, and he stretched forth his hand toward who? His disciples, the ones that were listening to him at the time, and said, what? Behold, my mother and my brother. He said, this is my real family. This is the family that really he and everybody is going to spend the most time with. Talking about eternity, right? All right, let's continue on. Look what he said in verse 50. He says, for whosoever should do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, what? The same is my what? Brother and sister and mother. In other words, God's family becomes his first family. The question is, has God's family become what? Your first family. Amen, somebody. Are you striving to put God first? over all other things, including family. If so, then you are uh, conforming to the image of Christ Jesus. Number three, the third aspect of Jesus' character that we must imitate and incorporate into our everyday lives is that he was a man who sought a long time with God. You see, example of him and God in this behavior where he separated himself to only be focused on God by himself Let's look at this for a moment. Let's go back to another scripture that gives an example of that, which is Matthew chapter 14, verse number 23. So I'm going to read to you out of the New King James Version. Look what the Bible says here. It says, and when he had sent the multitudes away. Sometimes, folks, you just got to get away from folk and just be by yourself. So he sent everybody away. Then what did he do? It said he went up into a mountain, what, a parch to pray. He went up there by himself, in other words. And when the evening was come, he was what? There? Alone. alone. You see, today we do the same thing. We have to daily find that time where it's just you and God and nobody else. But we do that through what? Daily Bible study and prayer. That's our time that we're seeking alone with the Lord. Is that all right now? Amen. All right. The fourth aspect of 
Jesus' character, this is going to get a whole lot of folk in me in trouble this morning, <laughs> is that he assembled in the synagogue on the holy day, which was the Sabbath at the time. Now, what I'm going to tell you this is a lot of people aren't going to like it, but I love you anyway. He never missed a Saturday because Saturday then was the day of worship, according to Exodus chapter number 20, right? But after the church came into existence, God changed the day of worship to the first day of the week. You'll see that in Acts chapter number 20, verse number 7, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and verse number 2. Another passage of scripture is going to show you that in the Christian era, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God put in the New Testament as the day, uh, in, in that which, in, which incorporates Sunday as the day of worship. You see that Hebrews 12, 24, Colossians 2, verse 3, uh, Colossians 2, verse 12, so forth and so on. 2, verse 14, let me get it right. That the New Testament era is what we live in. That's why we meet on a Sunday. But I want to point out that remember, Jesus was truly Jewish, right? Jesus was a child of God, so Jesus had to assemble on Saturday, every Saturday. Amen, somebody. But one thing you never see Jesus do on the day of worship, I got to work so I can't come. Huh? You never heard him say, well, I'm too tired to come to worship. You never heard him say, well, Mary and my brothers are in town, so I can't come worship today. Huh? We've come up with those excuses all the time. But Jesus, every day pattern, every time on every worship day, what happened? He was there to worship the Father. Now, I'll tell you this. I, I remember one time, it was one of the most humorous things I ever heard. It was a guy, and I, I give him credit, he was a new Christian. He didn't know much about the Bible, and you had to tell him, you know, Hebrews 10, verse 24, and so forth and so on, tells us we need to assemble every first day of the week to worship God. And his whole response was like, he had the most pu puzzled look. He's like, every Sunday? I mean, for real, his voice went up an octave. And like he was singing, every Sunday, yeah. Every Sunday, God expects you to be here. To worship him. You know, I, I, I heard, I, I forget what the figure is. I heard on the radio the other day. It was something like over 10,000 uh, minutes that's in a week. And you can't give him 60 minutes a week? Two hours a week? Come on now, that's pretty pathetic. You're telling me you can take 10,000 hours of your own and not give God anything? When you really think about it that way, that's how selfish that really is. And I know everybody's guilty of that. But remember, what I'm talking about today is what? Not just coming to worship on a holiday. Every Sunday. God wants you to give your, your thanks and your praise unto him. He wants to be acknowledged in your life. And I like to use relationships all the time to illustrate it. You know, single young ladies. You know, if you just give, if a guy just give you an hour a week, how long your relationship going to last? Amen. Amen. It ain't going to last. Come on now. People won't say amen because they're going to tell the truth. Because they can connect it to the church. <laughs> they know exactly. Man. What I'm saying, it ain't going to work. What kind of relationship is that? Or you just see your husband on holidays? <laughs> oh, amen, somebody. Man, I call that marriage a name only, ain't it? Because you ain't really got a husband. <laughs> you don't hear from him, but an hour a week, that kind of stuff. You know, I'm just, just, just point, putting some things out so that you see what we're talking about. So obviously then, Jesus always kept one day of the week holy, at least. And at least we can give him that. Is that enough, y'all? The last aspect of Jesus' character that we must imitate is his compassion for his fellow man. You see, the word of God says the following about him in Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, it says. Now look at this. Look what it says. Matthew chapter 14, verse number 14. The Bible says, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude 
and was moved with compassion toward them and what? Healed their sick. So the challenge of the hour becomes for us to put ourselves in a mirror spiritually. And I, and I want you to do this just in your own mind. Don't think about anybody else. But think about spiritually. You're looking in a mirror right now. And my question is, what do you see? Huh? What do you see? You know, sometimes when you get out of the shower and the mirror is all steamed up, right? You really can't see too much, right? And so in other words, if you want to get out there and get, get to work on time, sometimes you got to take a paper towel, right? And you got to what? Wipe it so you can see yourself, so you can do your hair, ladies. You do your makeup and all that kind of stuff. In other words, you got to prepare the vision, don't you? Huh? Well, I'm not talking about a mirror, and I'm not talking about your reflection. What I'm saying is, is this. If you look in the mirror of your soul, uh, somebody speaking, what do you see? Do you see Jesus reflected back at you? Or do you see something else that you regret at this time? Well, you know what? All is not lost. You know, just like we said with the mirror, when you're trying to get ready for work, take a handkerchief and start wiping the fog away from the mirror. All I'm saying is, is this. Take what you're learning today and work on it. Amen. And when that becomes the case, your mirror to your soul is going to start looking more and more like Jesus. Amen. It's going to start what? Coming more and more focused. All that condensation, all that fall is going to come off the mirror. Is that all right now? And it's going to start to come clearly that it's not just you. It's Jesus that you reflect. Oh, am I talking to anybody here today? See, so in summary, here's what you need to take away from here. Long story short, remember, in order to truly conform to the image of Jesus and be pleasing to God, we have to have complete devotion to God. We have to put God over family. We have to daily seek alone time with the Lord. We have to worship every Sunday. I sung it on purpose, y'all. And we have to have compassion for others to be a true Christian and imitator of Jesus for our salvation. May God bless you and keep you. The message is yours. But before you leave here and you're not saved, don't go another day without being saved. You remember, Jesus said, if any man be my disciple, let him, pick, uh, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow Amen. me. He also said in John chapter 14, verse number 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Amen. me. He's the only way you're going to see God in peace on that judgment day. He's the only way you're going to walk through the pearly gates of that heavenly city. He's the only way you're going to walk down those streets of gold. He's the only way that Revelation 21 verse 4 will happen for you in the afterlife. Where God said God is going to wipe away all tears for the saints' eyes. There'll be no more crying, dying, pain, no sorrow. And God again is going to wipe away all tears from the saints' eyes. He also talks about that heavenly existence in John chapter 1, uh, John chapter 14. Where he also says in verse 1 and verse number 2, he says... Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That place is prepared for the same. That place is prepared for those that will imitate the word, thoughts, and deeds of Jesus Christ. And what does the Bible tell us that we have to do to be saved? Well, all I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you right now, is I'm just going to be a mockingbird for the Bible. I can't add to it, nor can I take away. Amen. I can't put you in heaven, nor can I deny you Amen. heaven. But all I can do is report the truth. The Bible says, Romans 10, verse number 17, to get us uh, started off in the plan of salvation, that you got to hear the word of God Amen. in order to be saved. I didn't say you have to hear somebody's church doctrine. That's not going to save you. You have to what? Hear what? The word of God and the word of God, what? Exclusively. And you have to believe the testimony of the New Testament when it talks about Jesus being the son of God, which means he literally came from God the Father, suffered, died, and rose again, saying you may have a chance at eternal life. We already talked about that. John 3 verse 16 tells us that. 
But again, for emphasis sake, I repeat it. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You've got to believe that he's the son of God, which means your Lord and Savior, in order to make it through the pearly gates on the judgment day. You also must repent of your sins. Now, a lot of people don't want to talk about this part about uh, uh, of the plan of salvation, but we can't take it out. Is that all right, y'all? Because what do we say? We've got to conform to the image of his son. And his son said in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse number 5, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repent means what? Take on the Christian lifestyle of righteousness and turn your back on sinful living. That's all repentance basically means, that you're truly following Christ. In order to live right, you have to commit to that before God will save you. You also have to confess Jesus as the Son of God. We talk about that in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. But it's even more clear, Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10, where the Bible says, With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And you have an example in Acts 8, verse 37, where the Bible shows us a man before he was saved, the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And you must go down. It's not optional. You must go down in the watery grave of baptism. I don't know why people have such a hard time going down in the watery grave of baptism. I don't know why Billy Graham lied so much and said you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Folks, the Bible clearly says it. Remember, look at Matthew chapter number 3. Jesus was baptized. And if we're destined to imitate Jesus, we should go exactly where Jesus went. If Jesus had to go in the water to please the Father, there's no argument about that act being necessary for your salvation. Maybe you're asking, well, I want to know what baptism actually does. Well, God makes it clear. He's very clear on this, this topic. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21, the Bible says, Baptism doth not save us, not to put in the way of the field of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Remember that word D-O-T-A, baptism doth not save us, is the same thing as saying baptism does now save us. God is saying it's not a bath for the skin. It has nothing to do with the body. It's for what? The, the, the answer of a good conscience toward God. God. In other words, that's when God clears your conscience. You go down in that water. Let me be honest with you. If you're not a Christian already, you go down in that water feeling terrible. Huh? Because why? The, the, the guilt of your sins is all over you. You know you have not done right. You know you have not earned your way into heaven. But God is saying that after you come out of the water and you've been taught right, you understand that weight has been lifted off of you. You have no reason to feel guilty anymore. Why? Acts 22 verse 16 tells you why. The Bible tells us why terrorists thou. Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So when you go down in the water, that's when God applies the blood of Jesus to your life and you're no longer guilty of your sins because it was painful on Calvary. But you got to pass through the water for that to happen in your life. You have to pass through the water to get the guilt of your sins off of you and you have to pass through the water in order to be saved. Did we just hear that? First Peter 3 verse 21 just saying what? Baptism doth not save us. Right? Jesus also made it clear in Mark 16, verse number 16. He said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If he that believes not shall be damned. Is that all right now? That's the way that God designed it. I didn't design it that way. No man designed it that way. But if the word of God testifies to it, then we got to do it. And God cannot lie. He says that's when he decides to forgive you, huh? Then that's when he's going to forgive you. Is that all right, God? Let me let me put this on your heart so you get this real quick. I don't know about you, and husbands, I don't know how honest you're gonna be. But have you ever been locked out the house? 
I'm not talking because you left your keys. I'm talking because you did something. And your wife locked the screen door. That happened to me. That's all right, y'all. I'm one person. Your wife locked, locked the screen door because she was mad about something, right? Huh? And you just out there banging and banging and banging and banging. I ain't going to cycle. I ain't doing that. I just sat in the car. But anyway, just imagine what I'm talking about. You're banging, you're banging, you're banging and banging. Woman, you going to forgive me? Huh? You trying to what, force your way into the house. Amen. Right? But the door didn't open until what? She turned the lock. She opened the door. And I can go into my own bed then, right? Oh, amen, somebody. Because what's going to happen if you try to kick the door in the police? Go come. Huh? Well, what do you think that illustration is about? If you're trying to kick your way in the kingdom and, and, and have God forgive you on your own terms, God has some enforcers called angels. The real spiritual police, amen. And they're not going to usher you to heaven, they're going to usher you elsewhere. Amen, amen somebody. Amen. It's not until God decides to what? I forgive you. I open the door. Are you into the kingdom? Amen. Well, folks, if you don't obey the gospel in its 100% without deviation, you banging on the door and you can't get in. Huh? God opens the door after you hear the word of God. You believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who suffered, died, and rose again for you. You repent of your sins. You confess Christ as the Son of God. You take him on in baptism. And you remain faithful to your commission until your death. That's what he says in Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Of life. If you try to pray your way in, you try to kick the door in, you can't get there. It don't work like that. Amen, somebody. You just trying to just believe and not repent or do anything else? You try to keep the door in on your own. You can't get there Amen. that way. You can only come your way, and He has to open the door, which comes through repentance. Uh, excuse me, from hearing the word, believing, repentance, confession, baptism, and staying faithful unto death. You have an opportunity. We just sing a song of invitation, and now I'm, I'm, all we're doing is ask you to come down that aisle. We're gonna take your confession, two minutes of your time. All I'm going to do is what a preacher is supposed to do according to Acts chapter number 8. I'm supposed to ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you do, we go down in that watery grave of baptism. God ain't asking for much for you to do today. Just obey. Just obey. And then you come out of there, a new creation. All your sins will be washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. You'll be added to the church, and you'll be saved if you stay faithful unto death. You're a child of God, you walk disorderly. If you've done something that you know separates you from God, remember Isaiah 59, verse number 2, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 12 shows us that sin separates us from God. But God has some promises there. He shows us what to do if we're a Christian that has fallen short. He says, you also repent. Confess your fault and ask him to forgive you, and then he will do just that. And you'll be back on a peaceful relationship with him once again. We're going to sing that song of invitation. It's your opportunity. Come down that aisle. Together we sing a song of invitation. Won't you come as together? We sing. God bless you. Softly and tenderly.